Sean, and thank you, YPO. It's, uh, it's really amazing to be here, and thanks so much for inviting me to join you as together we explore the life of Re. And I just want to take a moment. Oh, good. Just wanted to make sure the slides were mapping here. Um, so now, for the next hour, I'd love to invite you to join me as we reimagine business as a platform for change. So let's start with a, with a couple questions just to kind of get you guys going and wake you up from the post-lunch a little there. Uh, so uh, raise your hand if your company or you personally are actually already giving back to the community or, or contributing to causes that you care about. OK, that's what I would have expected. All right, great. So now I'm curious how many of you actually thought about this right at the beginning when you were starting your company or when you first took over as a CEO. How many of you were actually doing that right at the start? Raise your hand. OK, great. Like statistically, we'd say that would be a lot, a lot less, so it's interesting to see. OK, and final question, how many of you want to build a successful company of the future? OK, like everyone should be raising your hand. I can tell that you are on your phone right now. <laughs> this is my way early on of kind of catching those who are not watching. But hopefully, we're all, we're all kind of excited to do that. And actually, I tease, but it, it's actually just to get serious. We are going to talk about what success means um, and how this is relevant. So in the past, you know, success for companies and the way most of us were taught to think about success was really about market share and profits and growth. Most of us were advised to like, keep our eyes on the prize. And then later, when we're more successful and when we're bigger, then we could think about giving back. But it was on the side. It was later and it was on the side. And most of us thought of it as an either or proposition. You know, it, you're either focused on profit and success or you're focused on purpose and giving back. But kind of not both. Like, that was not kind of something we would think about. So what if I told you that we have the power right here in this room to redefine what successful companies and successful leaders look like in the future? And that by redefining success, our companies would have the power to drive massive global change. So I'd like to invite you to think about what the world would look like, what our companies would look like, what our roles as CEOs and investors would look like, if embedding social impact into your company's DNA was the norm, and if it was commonly accepted that this is not just the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do. So just for fun, we're going to take a little quiz. Um, I've been told that, IP, uh, that YPOers love interaction and also that you're very competitive. So we're going to have a little fun here. Um, so in a couple of minutes, um, in a couple of moments, I'm going to ask you to stand up. But first, I'm just going to describe this little game. Uh, we're going to go through a couple questions. Uh, and for each question, I'm going to give you four possible answers. And you're going to choose which answer you want, kind of lock it into your head. And then I'm going to reveal the answer. And if you got the answer right, you're going to stay standing. But if you didn't get the answer right, you're going to sit down. And then we're going to do a couple of rounds of this, thrown in with some fun facts. And then we'll see who's left standing at the end. So you guys ready? All right. A little energy, guys. You ready? All right. Everyone stand up. All right. OK. So all of these quiz questions are going to help us recalibrate what it will take to be a successful company of the future. So Deloitte did a study of millennials in over 35 countries. Uh, and so they asked millennials uh, what the primary purpose of business was, or should be, actually, what it should be moving forward. So how many more of these millennials said improving society rather than generating profit? Is it, all right, for this one, I have to look up here because I actually can't see. Is it A, 11%, B, 24%, C, 63%, or D, 72%. You guys ready? Have you kind of chosen your answer? We got like the honor system going here. It's all locked in. Ready? And the big reveal is it's C, 63%. Oh, I see people cheering in the back. That's great. <laughs> all right, so those of you who got it right, stay standing. Those of you who didn't, sit down. Uh, Sean's sitting down already. Whoa. <laughs> but, all right, all right. So uh, the Deloitte study actually went on to say that millennials are actually imploring business leaders to take the lead in solving the world's problems. OK, keep standing. Those of you who had the answer right, keep standing. We're going to go through a couple more questions. Um, all right, so expectations of companies and their CEOs are changing. And I've been told that YPOers actually employ over 22 million employees around the world. So I'm sure you're very familiar with the fact that employee turnover and, um, and churn and disengaged employees actually cost over a trillion dollars each year. So I'm sure you'll be interested to know that 80% that of millennials want to feel a sense of purpose in their jobs. 
And that 78% of millennials will actually choose companies whose values align with their own. And just in case you kind of thought, oh, this is just a fad, this is gonna go away, I don't have to deal with this anymore, according to Forbes, 75% of the global workforce is going to be millennials in just a few years. Okay, so the next, keep standing, those of you guys who are getting it, you're doing a good job. Uh, all right, so the next question is around investors. So these same millennials that are thinking about the choices they're making and they're expressing their views and the way that they decide where to work are also going to be using those same sentiments when they make their investment decisions. And this is actually important because we're about to experience one of the largest transfers of wealth in history. So this first question is, um, how many uh, US dollars will be transferred from baby boomers to millennials over the next 30 years? Is it A, 100 billion? Is it B, 15 to 20 trillion? Is it C, 24 to 30 trillion? Or is it D, over 50 trillion? You guys ready? You locked it in? And the big reveal. It is C, 24 to 30 trillion. Okay, we've got a couple people still standing. That's good. Rock on. All right. So, uh, you know, I think we need to kind of think about these implications. The interesting thing is that we don't even need to wait 30 years because change is happening right now. According to a recent McKinsey study, 26% of the $88 trillion of assets under management are actually being invested with ESG considerations right now. So that's environment, social, and governance. Uh, so this is more than, let's pause for a second here, that's more than one out of every four dollars is being invested this way. So this change is already happening. And um, another study actually said that it, not only is it happening, but the change is happening really quickly. So just since 2016, the number of investment managers and money managers and institutional investors that are actually considering ESG has increased over 44%. So it's like, it's coming on us really quickly and it's changing rapidly. Okay, so this is a quote from Larry Fink, who actually runs, he's the CEO of BlackRock, and he said, companies that fulfill their purpose and responsibilities to stakeholders, including the community, are gonna reap rewards in the long term, and those that ignore them will stumble and fail. And he actually went on to say that this is only going to accelerate as millennials express their new expectations in the companies, that, what they think that companies should be, um, as they choose where to work, um, who to invest in, and also what to buy. Okay, and what to buy actually leads us to this next one around customers, and I apologize that this is a U.S. stat, but I actually still think it's really relevant. Um, so, according to a recent Cone study, 87% of Americans will purchase a product from a company because a company advocated for an issue that they care about. So, what percent will actually refuse to purchase a company from a product, a product or service from a company that basically doesn't align with their values, that's actually supporting an issue that's contrary to their views? Is it A, 33%, B, 49%, sorry, 45%, sorry. <laughs> this is where the glasses just aren't cutting in. I'm getting a little old here. Uh, C, 56%, or D, 76%. Okay, you ready? For those of you who just came in, we're playing a game, you're welcome to stand up and see if you get this. All right, so the big reveal is, it is D, 76. Okay, we still have, great, there's still a couple people up here. All right, so, um, <laughs> so actually, um, it's really interesting, we can, oh, if you're still standing, stay standing, we need to celebrate, who's still up? One person in the back? Two people, all right. Uh, well, first of all, let's give a round of applause to the two people who are still standing, <laughs> Awesome. Great job. You guys can actually sit down now, but like, way to go. Congratulations. Uh, so, uh, you know, when we think about this consumer, it's really interesting. People are like basically voting with their wallets. Uh, and they are, they are buying products with companies that they care about. And this is affecting profits and also growth. So Corn Ferry did a recent study and they said that um, consumer companies that are basically um, purpose driven are seeing a three times the uh, growth rate uh, than the typical S&P 500. And um, we have this other stat here from Nielsen that says 66% of consumers are actually willing to pay extra for products uh, from companies that they believe are committed to kind of social issues. And I think this is really interesting because there's a positive we need to think about, like rewarding the positive behavior, but we also need to be aware in this age where consumers are more and more aware of where things are made and how things are made, that it's just as important to kind of avoid the negative when we're making these decisions. And consumers are definitely thinking about supply chains and how things are happening. 
And then even the CEO of Unilever tweeted and acknowledged that his purpose-driven brands are growing 50% faster than the non-purpose-driven brands. So like, this is real, this is happening. So hopefully, after this little quiz, we can all reset our thinking and acknowledge that moving forward, social impact isn't just the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do. And successful companies of the future can and should play a role in tackling the world's most pressing issues. So let's rethink what this might actually look like if that really was the case, if it really was the norm. Um, and this is something that I'm really passionate about, so if any of this really resonates with you, like, please email me or find me later. But like, imagine this world, you know, a world where maybe in the corporate formation process, people, when they're going through their regular forms and filling out the legal documents, part of it is actually um, focused on uh, what their commitment is to give back that will grow kind of over time. Or imagine if setting aside equity for philanthropy was as common as setting aside equity for your future employees. And with every round of funding, you'd top off your philanthropy pool in the same way that you top off your employee pool. And it would be a natural part of your bank and your advisor's playbook as you're on your road to IPO. And imagine if there was continuing education for attorneys and standards around what this equity would look like. So almost like you know, common term sheets for investments. This wasn't being created again and again, but the experts and advisors out there, this would be kind of part of the norm of what they would be advising on. And imagine if when a company was on their way for an IPO or an acquisition, the media coverage wasn't just covering like what the stock price hit that day, but they were also talking about um, the value that the company has already created and also the potential of the new philanthropy that's being ignited through this IPO. So personally, I think that's exciting, but I imagine what you're really thinking about right now and the question on your mind is how? So if giving back is both the right thing to do and the smart thing to do, how exactly do we embed it into our DNA? What does that mean? So I think this might be a fitting time for me to just take a moment and explain what Pledge 1% is all about. So Pledge 1% is a global movement to create a new normal where giving back or social impact is actually embedded into the DNA of companies of all sizes and stages. And where companies creatively and collaboratively leverage all of their assets to be a force for good. So Pledge 1% is really an easy, flexible framework for companies to pledge 1% of time, product, profit, or equity to any cause of their choice. It doesn't go through us. We're just about empowering and really building this movement. And we really see our role as inspiring, educating, and empowering every company and every founder to really think about how to leverage all their assets to tackle some of the world's toughest social issues and drive change. We were actually founded, um, we were inspired by the model that was created by Mark Benioff when he founded Salesforce, and I know Salesforce is a great global partner of YPO. Uh, and so on day one, when Mark started Salesforce, he thought about what kind of company did he want to build? Yes, he wanted to be successful. Yes, he wanted it to be innovative. But he wanted to build the kind of company where it could be a force for good and where it would actually attract the kind of talent that cared about that as well and that that would be their legacy and what they would build together. And so on day one, he set aside 1% of equity when equity wasn't worth anything. He set aside 1% of product or at least made that commitment when there wasn't even a product built. Uh, he committed 1% of time when there weren't even employees to give time. But again, this was just the way to kind of build and really set the ethos for what was going to be at the core essence of what Salesforce was all about. And similarly, when Scott Farqua, who's also a YPO member, actually, uh, started um, Atlassian, which is based in Australia, he had that same ethos, uh, and he actually added profit to the mix. So about four years ago, Atlassian and Salesforce got together with the founders of Techstars, along with some really forward-thinking investors like Ron Conway from SB Angel and Seth Levine from, from the Foundry Group, and basically they created the Pledge 1% movement. So we're very much a startup ourselves. We've been around about four years, and we have over 8,500 uh, companies in over 100 countries that have now joined the movement. You can see some of our brands up there. And in fact, we also have some amazing ecosystem partners, so um, Techstars and 500 Startups and whatnot. And in fact, while I'm here, my whole team is in at Austin at South by Southwest, running one of the biggest startup events uh, in, at South by, uh, thanks to um, our, our amazing uh, ecosystem partners. Uh, so Pledge 1% was also named by Fast Company, the number one most innovative nonprofit in the world, and one of the top 50 uh, most innovative companies. And um, 
This picture, actually, you can see the photo on the right. That's actually Times Square. So we've had the honor for two years in a row of ringing the NASDAQ bell to kick off Giving Tuesday, which is a global day of giving. Um, and we had about 50 of our leaders from around the world fly in to be there with us and actually hold up signs for their brands and really inspire others. And it was actually a really amazing moment. Hopefully, some of you will join us uh, this year. We'll be, we'll be back there on Giving Tuesday. Um, but basically, the point of this slide is we've only been around four years. We've grown 150% each year, uh, and we've already ignited, our members have already ignited over a half a billion dollars of new philanthropy, and we're just getting started. This year alone, Pledge 1% member IPOs like DocuSign, Upwork, Zora, Pluralsight, and SurveyMonkey, and acquisitions like Weebly and Gliffy have already ignited hundreds of new, hundreds of millions of new phil philanthropy. Oops, looks like, uh, all right, this is, uh, for the tech folks, it doesn't seem like it's syncing, so if you could help with that, that would be great. We're, we're on different slides. Uh, all right. Uh, so that might be a little difficult. Can we pause? Can we, do you think it's a quick fix? Sorry, guys. Well, this is on a different slide than that one. Oh, now it's, okay. Looks like we're back now. All right, perfect. All right, thanks guys, slight intermission there. Uh, maybe we should do another quiz and uh, see what's going on. <laughs> Everyone stand up, okay. Uh, so anyway, so we, we've had like all this great momentum with these, uh, these uh, companies having their IPO because they set aside their equity. Millions and millions of dollars of new philanthropy have been set aside. Um, and I would say that we've got thousands of companies that are having an impact long before the liquidity events, um, whether they're big unicorns like Slack and Postmates, 40-person companies like Gliffy or rising stars like Flexport. Lots of great stuff happening by leveraging product and time and technology and voices, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So I'm really thrilled to be here as, as you're rolling out YPO3, 3.0 in this special moment, and as you as YPOers are really re-envisioning what your role is going to be. And I think like given the extraordinary leaders here um, and the, just the special breed of human beings that I found are YPOers that I've, that I've just really loved and enjoying interacting with the last couple of days, I'm sure that all of you or most of you are already doing just absolutely amazing things in the community. You know, whether that's building schools for thousands of children after a tsunami or entrepreneurship. I had a, someone talk to me about doing a shark tank in a prison and teaching uh, prison inmates entrepreneurship. Um, I talked to another member of, who was um, very passionate about helping um, young adults uh, in um, areas of high unemployment find their first job and developed a technology platform to make that happen. I talked to another IPOer who's actually taking a model that was developed by Harvard around STEM education and bringing it to Brazil and leveraging his tech team to actually bring this to life. So lots and lots of amazing things happening by all of you. Um, and it's just, it's just been a thrill to kind of hear these stories. Um, but I would actually urge you, not but, but like and, in addition to that, to think about the impact you could have beyond that direct impact of what you're doing. Think about as leaders of the third largest economy combined, you have the power to ignite thousands, if not millions, of other CEOs to also think about what they can do and how they can leverage all of their assets to be a force for good. And to me, that could be like truly transformational if you could really be that catalyst to have that ripple effect um, and that multiplier effect. Um, that's when you can have really that transformational impact on the world. And that's what's possible if together we really did make social impact the norm. So let's think about the norm for a second here. I, I haven't talked a little bit about my background, although Sean gave some like awesome highlights, so thank you for that. Um, you know, I really had just the privilege of partnering with incredible teams to help just cutting edge ideas scale. I love to help scale ideas. Um, and so in 1997, I left McKinsey to join Netscape. And when I came to Netscape, well, first Netscape had its browser business. Uh, then they had their enterprise software. And when I came to Netscape in 1997, our homepage was the most traffic site on the entire internet. But all that was on the homepage was the download button and the camera to the fish tank in the engineer's office, the fish cam. And that was the internet in 1997. We were number one, and I think Pamela Sue Anderson of Baywatch was number two, and that, that was the internet. <laughs> so, uh, and, and we were part of the team that said, hmm, I wonder if we can make a business out of this. 
Uh, so it was an exciting time. I ran our first online newsstand, helping companies like Wall Street Journal and Fromers and Rolling Stone get online, helping smaller companies really get access to kind of um, thousands or millions of users. I launched our first web-based email. So this is before uh, Microsoft bought Hotmail and long before Google and Gmail. Um, we, we bought this uh, web-based email off the ground, I guess maybe one of the original cloud applications there. And I spent a lot of time explaining that the internet was not going to go away. So, um, and here we got like a little bit of a, a Time magazine of like, what's this weird and wacky thing called the internet? So to me, that's, that's the bar we need to hit. When we think about like truly transformational, most of us can't even remember a time when there wasn't an internet or when there wasn't like, instant access to information through Google and finding things. Or, or for me, I can't even remember a time when I didn't have my smartphone that I think a lot of you guys are looking at right now, so back up here. <laughs> it's just our default way of thinking. We just, we just, you know, we just use it. It's just part of who we are. We can't even remember what it was like before. And to me, that's what it means. That's what it will feel like when we are truly transformational and when we really make social impact the norm. We'll get that same little chuckle. We'll say, maybe five years or 10 years from now, we'll be sitting in a room like this and we'll say, do you remember that time when we had to explain that doing, you know, integrating, giving back was both the good thing and the right thing and the smart thing? Remember when we had to explain that and people didn't just know it, it wasn't just obvious? So hopefully we'll, we'll come back to Edge in like 10 years and we'll be able to have a good chuckle over that. And it will be as, as, as common as saying, you know, the internet's not going away. So to bring this to life a little bit, I'm gonna talk about three trends that we're seeing in corporate philanthropy today. And by philanthropy, I'd say expand your mind, kind of think about it a little broad. So, so first, um, and we talked about this a little bit already, but the first trend we're seeing is baking it into your DNA. So that's from, in the past, it was really like at the end, like wait till you're bigger and successful and then do it, to the beginning. At the, it used to be on the side, so a lot of companies would get bigger and then they would basically say, okay, we're gonna form like a little foundation, we'll put you over there, you're gonna run it, give some grants, maybe you organize some volunteer activities, and that's great, it's on the side. And now we really see companies baking it into the core. So what exactly does that mean? Let me give a couple examples. You know, when you bake it in early on, the scrappiness really breeds innovation because you don't really have a lot of money. So you're kind of trying to figure out how do you make it happen. So last is like a great example of how they, they were kind of scrappy and that, that really helped them to breed innovation early on. So in the early days of Atlassian, they did a really interesting twist on a freemium model. And for those of you that don't know a freemium model, typically there's one level of service or product or number of licenses that's free. And then if you want more, you basically have to pay. And that, that's the premium level of it. And so Atlassian basically in the early days said, you know, we're gonna do a starter kit and we're gonna be able to give 10, 10 licenses in the starter kit so folks can get a feel for what Atlassian's all about. But rather than making it free, and this was an idea that came from employees, and I wanna actually um, throw that out there that all these examples I'm, I'm about to say are all ideas that came from the employees. Uh, but this was an idea that an employee had, you know, let's make it $10 which essentially is free. This wasn't $10 a month or $10 a day. This was actually $10 total, so not really a lot of money, but $10 for 10 licenses. But all that money is gonna go to Room to Read. And more specifically, it's gonna go to girls in Cambodia and keeping them in school and actually helping them get to secondary school, which at the time, less than 1% of girls were doing in Cambodia. And so through this process, they actually raised millions of dollars for Room to Read. In fact, when Atlassian went public, they were the largest corporate funder of, of Room to Read on a global level. Um, and it's all because they started this program. And, and what I think is so exciting is through this program then, they were able to like form really loyal and you know, wonderful bonds with their customers who were really excited that this was part of who they are and it reflected Atlassian's core values, one of which is be the change you see. Um, and also it really instilled this incredible sense of pride um, in the employee base of Atlassian because this is what they were able to do. Another example is Flexport, which is a, another Pledge One company. Um, Flexport was recently named one of Forbes' fastest growing companies. And they, they also had an employee brainstorm. They had a pledge of, of time. Um, and through that pledge of time, uh, Flexport employees decided, you know, we, we should actually build a carbon calculator and embed it into our product so that when our customers are, are booking their shipping, they can actually see um, you know, how much 
you know, what's the, what's the you know, waste that's coming from this? And how can, um, and then maybe actually bake in through a partnership a way for them to actually do the offset right there in the calculation, like pay for it right there. And so they did, they partnered with carbonfund.org to enable all customers to do the carbon offset right there in their product. Um, and then they issue like annual reports so that these companies and their clients can actually integrate it into their own sustainability reports. And then Flexport took the extra step and said, okay, if you're, if you're doing a full load or a full container, we'll give you the ability to pay for it yourself through this calculator. But if you're doing like a partial container, we'll, we'll actually pay for that. So that there's basically, um, we're totally carbon neutral across the board. So, um, and then they went on to basically offer nonprofit steep discounts through a product pledge. Um, and then they also uh, realized that a lot of companies were disposing of their inventory um, and uh, Flexport said, you know, we'll actually help take it off your hands and we'll distribute it uh, to where it might be needed. And in doing so, they actually prevented over 3.9 million pounds of landfill waste. So again, these are, these are like way before liquidity events, really interesting ways that they're embedding it into their core of what they're all about. Postmates is another really great example. Um, and, and they're, you know, unicorn that, you know, per the press is getting close to IPO. Um, but they, they created this program called Food Fight. And what they realized was, hey, you know, we have relationships with thousands and thousands of restaurants. Um, and all of these restaurants, at the end of the day, have food that's going to go to waste, that they're just throwing out. And then we're a gig economy play, so we've got relationships with, like, hundreds of thousands of couriers that, um, basically, typically pick these things up and bring them to you for dinner, but hey, why can't they pick up the food at the end of the day and actually deliver it to, um, to shelters or for nonprofits to distribute to those who are in need? And hey, we actually have the technology, it's almost like an Uber-like technology that actually makes that matching happen. So they leverage their employee time pledge to actually like build this extra product functionality um, to work with their marketing team and their program management team to build this program so that they could enable um, their companies to sign up for it as well as their couriers. And they leverage their profit pledge to actually continue to pay the couriers even if they're delivering this, this, um, this food to the nonprofits as well. So they could have just made a donation to like a food bank and called it a day, but by really integrating it into their core, They've now built like great relationships, you know, both internally with their, you know, with their customers and with their um, employees, and also with their gig economy contractors and whatnot, as well as externally. And the incredible exponential impact that they're actually able to have by delivering all this food in all the local communities that they serve. So I'm going to say that the second trend is really about engaging your network. So all of the examples I just talked about, you could see that they, they did more than has had a direct impact in their own company. They basically thought about how are they engaging their customers, their network, um, uh, and whatnot to really make a difference. So they're thinking exponentially. But so this is really a shift, I think. I think old CSR was a lot of like, look at me, look at my brand. And new CSR, or this new way of thinking, is really about look at we, and look at our leverage. Look at what we can do together and kind of shift in your mindset a little bit to think about like how can you have that, that force multiplier, that exponential effect. So at Pledge 1%, we actually have this, this ethos that we say. We call it pledge it forward. And the idea is don't just take the pledge. I mean, take the pledge, but don't just take the pledge. Think about what you can do to invite, encourage, and empower everyone around you to also join in and really reinforce this idea that no one is too small or too early or too big or too late to really think about how they can make a difference. So a couple of examples here, a couple more. Uh, Twilio is another pledge company, another company that had a recent IPO um, and also set aside equity. And uh, actually, this is kind of a fun fact. Their CEO, Jeff Lawson, was recently on uh, Kramer, Mad Money, literally like just last week, along with um, Samir, who's the um, CEO of SendGrid, another YPO member. Uh, and, uh, and they basically, they're so passionate about this that they were on there with Kramer talking about like how every late stage company should set equity aside and should really you know, think of this on uh, unlocking this value on the way to their IPO. But true that our corporate values, Twilio really cares about communications. Um, and two years ago, Twilio launched what they called an impact core because um, they wanted to engage the 1.6 million developers in their network and help them really think about how they can leverage uh, Twilio technology to make a difference. 
So they realized that many nonprofits need a lot of help when it comes to communications, and many of these developers really wanted to make a difference, but there was a little bit of a loss in translation. Like there was you know, no connecting between the two of them. And so this impact core that Twilio launched, which is like this technology platform, really helps to make this connection. And all of this is still in addition to the direct grant making that Twilio is doing. So they just, they just announced about $14 million of, of, of grants um, based on communications needs uh, just last month. So another example along these lines, DocuSign, another company that took the pledge, pledged equity recently, um, had their IPO. Um, just a couple months ago, um, they were at Davos, uh, and they announced um, a program called Fighting for Forests, uh, where they said, okay, you know, we want to improve people's paper usage and their environmental policies like in their companies, and we're gonna invite all of our customers to join with us, and if our customers join with us, then they're committed to making this happen with each customer that joins, it will trigger new funding, and they committed over $1.5 million just in 2019 to this effort. And again, it wasn't just them doing it, this is a way that they're triggering all their customers to join with them, and actually, you know, in a great way, kind of leveraging the playbook from DocuSign um, to help them figure out how. Uh, and this is actually also interesting because the $1.5 million, half of it came from the DocuSign Impact Fund, but actually half of it came from the CEO himself in his own personal capacity. So we're seeing a lot of these interesting kind of combo deals when it comes to uh, philanthropy as well, and we see it on the equity side as well. So Impact Cloud, this is an interesting example. Um, uh, that when we say look at we, sometimes it's about leveraging your network, as we've talked about. Sometimes it's about collaboration. So here's an example of a number of companies that realize, hey, when it comes to disaster relief um, and crisis responders, uh, for whatever reason, this is being reinvented every single time. Like the technology is this scramble to kind of bring it all together and, and think about things. So these companies got together and said, well, can't we kind of weave all of our products together and actually come up with a solution for like Team Rubicon um, that actually makes it significantly easier for crisis responders to deploy resources, assess needs, and really collaborate on solutions. And so they came together and they built this together. Another example, just you know, closer to home here, are, you know, at Pledge 1%, we have this program called The Builders that really came out of the members saying, hey, um, we're super excited by all this growth, but we're really concerned that there'll be all these pledges, but no action, because a lot of younger companies don't really know how to do this. So our builders said, hey, you know, we want to actually share our expertise and invest not just our money, but also our time in working with you to build resources and actually empowering companies around the world to do this in a more successful way. Um, and Salesforce is a great example of this. You know, as we talked about 19 years ago, they pioneered the 111 model. Um, so Salesforce, on its own way, directly, has already given out to nonprofits and universities over 39,000 of them have received free product from Salesforce, over $240 million in grants from Salesforce, and over 3.5 million hours from Salesforce. So that's pretty amazing. But I'd say beyond that, if you think of that force multiplier that I think Salesforce was so awesome, is that they took their model and they gave it away. They shared it, they said, hey, you know, we wanna form this movement, we wanna see how we can have that force multiplier effect. And so to that end, over 500 Salesforce partners have also joined the movement and are part of this. Um, and there's even 100 portfolio members in the Salesforce Ventures portfolio that have actually taken the pledge and are doing this as well. And Salesforce has integrated Pledge 1% and this whole idea of giving back um, all throughout Dreamforce, which is their primary user conference. Um, and they just have had this incredible effect of impacting others. And this is kind of a fun story, but Salesforce also was responsible for kind of getting Google to set aside equity before Google went public. And you know, you can just see like that one ripple effect alone. The Google CEO recently announced that they were pledging or they were they plan to do a billion dollars, that's a billion with a B, of new grants in the next five years and a million dollars of uh, volunteer hours just in the next five years, and that's just one company of the ripple effect. So you can really see the impact you can have this way. And Techstars, which I think is another YPO partner, um, also a Pledge 1% partner, um, they're a global network of accelerators, but they're really committed to helping founders succeed. And to Techstars, they fundamentally believe that the way the founders can, can, can succeed is by having this ethos of give first. Um, so they think that this is really how they can help them. And so with that, um, they see inviting and encouraging 
all of their founders or founders that are, are touched by Techstars to join the movement as, as one of, and to get the support of Pledge 1% is one of the most effective things they can do. So right now, Pledge 1% is actually integrated into every Techstars application around the world. So everyone who's part of the Techstars ecosystem, even at the top of the funnel, uh, is basically asked, do they want, they're, they're given an offer, would you like to join this movement? Even if they don't get into the accelerator, they still have access to all the Pledge 1% resources and support and network and whatnot to help them be successful. And Atlassian, I need to kind of keep coming back to Salesforce and Atlassian, but I know Salesforce is a global partner and Atlassian is um, founded by a YPO member, so I kind of think they're fun to talk about. But Atlassian Foundation, after their IPO, um, they kind of said that they had three pillars to their foundation. They educate is their big hairy ass goal, of the millennial goal of 10, 10 million children in 10 years. Enlist is, um, I'm sorry, Energize is about getting their employees involved. But Enlist, the third pillar of their whole foundation strategy is really about the multiplier effect they can have by turning the light on inside of other CEOs and other founders around the world and getting them to take the pledge. So I think there's a real huge opportunity for YPO here, and we're going to come back to this, but there's, as I mentioned, there's the direct impact that all of you can have and already are having with all the incredible things you're doing, but there is this multiplier effect. If you can inspire and really empower others to really propel this movement forward and make this the new normal. Oops. Okay, so the third trend, the third trend is blurring of the lines. And I have a little 20 month little girl at home, so this little finger painting thing really resonated with me. <laughs> so if you, any of you have kids, you know what it's like when things are just kind of blended together, but kind of think through that a little bit. Uh, so blurring of the lines means that, you know, there's, we're moving from a world of silos. Um, I think how things used to be is, okay, you've got your sustainability group, and then you have like your HR department that's maybe thinking about diversity and inclusion, and you've got your volunteer department, and maybe you've got your public policy department that's thinking about kind of regulation and, and advocacy and things like that. And really what we're seeing is all these things just being blended together to think about like how are you actually reflecting your core values, and how are you actually thinking about all of your stakeholders, not just your investors, but also your employees, your customers, and the community. So this blended impact model. So I think, once again, I mean, Salesforce is a really interesting example here. Um, equality is one of the core tenets of their business, and they genuinely believe that this will make them a better company. And it's why they've done things like invest in education over $50 million, um, and also have this incredible vet force program helping veterans kind of learn great Salesforce skills so that they have access to new jobs. Um, they've also spent a lot of time on equal pay. So Salesforce did their own self-assessment to see, hmm, are men and women actually being paid equally? And they realized, you know what? They're not. So they invested over $9 million in the last three years to basically make sure there's more equality there. They also have really come out around equal rights and equal pay and have actually like threatened to take their business out of areas where there were kind of laws or bills like on the table that were actually really discriminatory. Um, and they've done a lot of great things for the environment too. So I think what we're really seeing when we think of these blurring of the lines is that there's a blurring of the lines a little bit between business and politics, and also a blurring of the lines between a CEO's values and your company's values. And we're seeing this new breed of CEO activism I think, you know, where even beyond like Salesforce in the last year we've seen Lyft, Google, Intel, Apple have all made statements on issues including like the travel ban or trends vendor in the military or 400 CEOs came out around DACA. Um, so, I mean, in the past, I think CEOs and companies really got involved in policy when it was about regulation or maybe when it was about, um, you know, things that would infect your bottom line. But now we're seeing CEOs and companies getting involved in policy where it affects their other stakeholders, where it affects their core values, where it affects the lives of their customers, employees, and the communities they care about. And you can see Vidyard is a company based in Toronto that actually was so bold to say like, hey, you know what? We're gonna put out a list of our stakeholders and you know what investors? You're actually at the bottom of the list. So customers first, customer centric, we love that, employees, and then the community. Community is kind of ranking up. So all of this blurring of the lines and surpassing, you know, of the confines of traditional philanthropy is, uh, uh, really makes the impact stronger and it makes the companies more successful. So, so let's just take a moment. We're going to do another little interactive exercise, uh, kind of get you guys going. I'm kind of seeing some post-lunch lull going on there. So I'd say turn to a neighbor, so kind of break off in twos. Um, 
David Spencer, I can't believe I just saw you there. So this is my fellow business school uh, classmate that I haven't seen probably in about 20 years is sitting right there. It's kind of fun. Uh, and uh, um, so here's, here's the exercise. So get into pairs and think about, we're just going to have about like, you know, six to eight minutes on this. So it's going to be really quick. I'll let you know when we're about halfway through. Uh, but the first question is, how have you integrated social impact into your companies so far? Like, what have you done to kind of integrate it? And the second question is really about this move from me to we. How, how could you potentially in the future leverage your network uh, to do more? And that could be your professional network, your business network, it could be your YPO network, um, and that could be about affecting local issues, global issues, the movement overall, but, um, but think about that. So okay, so everyone break into pairs, and uh, we're gonna start you off here. I'm gonna start the timer, and let's go. Hi, thanks, uh, Jason. Um, so one of the things is I think in South Africa, this is kind of a, a, I guess, a normal practice to a large degree, but one of the things that I took out of this was about the network effect. Mm -hmm. Because what we haven't considered is we're doing it as individual companies, and the one thing we don't like to do is just write a check and give it to philanthropists because they kind of have their own agendas. We prefer our employees to actually, or what we call our team, uh, to actually go out and make the impact themselves, but we'll fund it. But I think using the network around you as businesses, we have a huge supply chain, huge network of uh, communities. And so if we had to get them all together, we could probably make a significantly bigger impact than what we're just doing alone. So that was the aha moment for me. Awesome. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, I, I do think, especially with this group, that the network effect is just so powerful. I think we've got another from the conductor up here. <laughs> Yeah, we just we just talked about this. Um, rather than rather than looking at only pieces of a of a business, how to uh, you know improve things, when you look at from an impact you might have, um, when you look at a holistic way, um, employees, suppliers, the products, how you produce, how you sell, um, it actually improves the profit of the company mm -hmm. by doing that. Bec and the first kicker is this shareholder, the stakeholder value mm -hmm. approach, not a shareholder value approach. Right. Yeah. With all the trends you're showing, there's a little bit of what we we, talk we talked about. So thinking about all the stakeholders and also how it's 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 not this trade off. Like actually, you're you're going to be a more successful company, and you don't have this like tension that I think used to be there. Like oh, I want to do that, but I should be focusing on it because I'm focusing on my investors, so I need to be over here. It's like it's it's all coming together if you're thinking about shareholder value in a unified way. Yes, Sorry. correct, and it, we are actually an impact investor, so. Oh, awesome, yeah. This is talking to businesses. Oh, great, terrific. Any, I think maybe like one more, any others? Yeah, go ahead, Oop, I think over there. Hi, Amy. Hi. Um, so I'm from Dubai, and uh, we are a human intensive company, so we employ about 15,000 people. And we decided recently that instead of offering our, we were trying to figure out in our open HR forum, how do we motivate and incentivize employees a little more? And instead of giving them a gift card for their birthday or whatever, we're gonna actually give that donation to Feed the World or UNICEF, and then they'll get an email saying that on your birthday, this was donated by the company. So we just thought that's a nicer thing to do than to just sort of give them a gift card or a discount or a half a day off. I know, that's uh, that's great. I love it. I mean, I think kind of cr thinking creatively about that is 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 an awesome idea. And um, we definitely have seen companies that instead of giving swag for the holidays to their employees, they take all the money that would have been done for swag and they donate it to a cause. Or um, or I love the birthday idea. Kind of something feels more individual and special that way. So that's great. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to do kind of a quick close. Um, so I, I'm, a, I'm an impact junkie, and I, I love to think about like action. So I don't love to just kind of leave on a, hmm, that's, not, that's nice, what am I going to do about it? So I'm going to leave you with a two-part challenge. So the first part of the challenge is be creative. So when you go home, meet with your team. Uh, this could be your work team, this could be your family, this could be your chapter, this could be your forum. But really think about how you can stretch and get creative, really leveraging kind of all of your assets, so your product, your time, your talent, your network, your voice, and your other assets, and really think about kind of what we were talking about. What does it really mean, or what would it look like if you really embedded this into your DNA? Um, so, so that's like homework assignment number one. Um, and then the second is 
you know, if this resonates with you, um, help us build the movement. Uh, you know, it takes 30 seconds to take the pledge and really join the movement. You can go to p1.today, which is a shortcut. Um, and if you're thinking, oh, I'm already doing this, I don't need to do that, like, that's even more the reason to do this. Um, think about what I said about pledging it forward. I think if you're, if you're already giving back, be a role model, be a leader, share your story, enable us to share your story, and let's inspire others. And let's share it in a way that, hey, this is what I'm doing, but, but by the way, uh, by the way, you can do this too, and you can do it, and you can do it, and nobody's too small to do this, and nobody's too big to do this. And I think that if you could think about yourselves that way, take the pledge, tell others about it, um, really ignite and encourage others, we could all really have an, an exponential effect. And, and I'd also say that um, we didn't get to talk about this, but Pledge 1% itself is at a really interesting inflection point. We've obviously demonstrated a powerful proof of concept, but we're, we're poised to dramatically increase our scale uh, so that we can provide more resources and more support and really help our members get from pledge to action. So we've, we've just secured a, a multi-million dollar commitment actually from kind of one of our, our founders, actually our YPO member founder, and, um, uh, and we're really looking to build a world-class team of leaders uh, to really take things to the next level. So if, if getting, if, if this movement like really resonates with you and you're thinking like, hey, I wanna help think through how do I get corporate formation integration in my country, or I wanna help make the standards the norm, or I wanna think through like how I, my company can be a builder, or how I can maybe get involved you know, on your visionary council, or maybe even like a little tiger team to help think through how do we get other YPO people involved, just email me, uh, drop kind of team YPO in the title so I can kind of easily like find this in the thousands of emails. Um, and also I would just say, I really want to talk to you and the team wants to talk to you, but we're, we're a really small but mighty team. So please, please be patient if I don't get back right away and you have my permission to stalk me if I don't to kind of keep going because I really want to hear from you and I, I think we can do great things together. I think your legacy is really to redefine what it means to be the successful company of the future and really make social impact the norm. And we have the power to do that. So I just kind of leave you by thinking like, what if we all gave 1%? You know, if you think about the talent and connections and technology and influence right here in this room, and then you multiply that by like everyone in this building, right, and all the rest of the people in the YPO network, and then you multiply that by the 22 million employees that you all touch, and then you think through kind of as you brought up, you know, your supplier network and your customer network and all the other CEOs out there that you could inspire to take the pledge, and then you think about, okay, and for all those other CEOs, what are all their assets in terms of their networks and their technology and their products and their people, then you can think, just imagine the possibilities if we start collaborating and really take on some of the toughest issues of our time. Just imagine the transformational impact we could have on the world together. So with that, I'll say thank you. Um, my email's there again if you're interested, and I'm, I'm also happy to answer any questions um, up here at, afterwards, and, um, and also p1.today. Please, I hope you'll, hope you'll join us. Thank you very much. Thank you.